Our New Testament text this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, and this can be found on page 17 in the New Testament section of your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them saying, get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What's your story? More specifically, what do you know about your family's story? Do you know where your grandparents grew up and how they made a living? Do you know how your parents met, the story of how they fell in love? Do you know your family's greatest success? Do you know your family's story? The Do You Know scale was developed by two psychologists who used it to assess the emotional health of children. The psychologists discovered that the more children knew about their family's history, the more they felt in control of their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more they felt their families functioned well. It turns out this do you know scale is a great predictor, not just of happiness and well-being, but also of resilience, how easily children recover from setbacks, big and small. This strange story we just heard is a pivotal story in our tradition Not only is it found in three of the four Gospels, but it is one of just a handful of stories that gets a particular Sunday of the church year dedicated to it every single year. And that's always the Sunday before Lent, the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. Somewhere along the way, a decision was made that this story of a literal mountaintop experience is one we need to hear before we enter this season of preparation for the lowest moment in the gospel story, Jesus' death on a cross. Which makes me wonder, how does knowing this story help us prepare for that? On top of the mountain in our story, something happens to Jesus, something that cannot be explained by the laws of physics. He is transfigured, literally, physically, actually changed. The text describes this change with words. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Now consider, he's just hiked up a dusty mountain. But we get the sense that words can't really describe what happened there. Not only was Jesus himself dramatically changed, but there were others at the top of that mountain who did not climb to get there. The narrator leaves no doubt as to their identity. It is Moses and Elijah, two of the patriarchs of Jesus' family, one a leader who led God's people to freedom and gave them God's law, 
and the other the most influential of Israel's prophets. As Jesus takes his place between the law and the prophets, a voice announces, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Hearing this story today, we have the privilege of knowing what the disciples don't know, that when they make their way down the mountain, they are beginning a new phase of their journey, a phase that will end, or at least appear to end, in tragedy. And for that whole journey to the cross and beyond, Peter, James, and John will carry with them the memory of this mountaintop experience, an experience they don't understand and cannot explain. Jesus tells them not even to talk about it or tell other people about it, but it is nevertheless with them always, for it is now a part of their story. Like a promise made by a mother to her children that everything will be all right, or like the vows made between two people who promise to stand by each other and love each other in the best of times and in the worst. Are you familiar with the idea of an after image? An after image is an optical illusion where an image that you've seen continues to appear briefly in your sight even after exposure to the image has ended. One thing that will produce an after image is a particularly bright stimulus, especially if the conditions around the stimulus are dark. A flash of lightning, for example, in a night sky that seems to linger in your field of vision even after it is gone from view. Jesus transfigured his clothes and face and skin shining bright surely lingered in the disciples' minds like an afterimage, reminding them in the darkest moments to come that Jesus is indeed the one they heard God claim him to be, the Son of God, the one who came to show us God's love. Likewise, for us, this story of this mountaintop experience provides an afterimage, an image that offers us comfort and hope as we face the inevitable challenges that come with following Jesus. Those psychologists who developed the Do You Know scale discovered that when parents teach children their family stories, they usually choose one of two kinds of narratives, either ascending or descending. An ascending narrative is a story like this. We started from nothing. But then, because of your grandparents' hard work at the family business, we became successful. A descending narrative is of a family that used to have it all, but because of an illness or a stock market crash or a natural disaster, lost everything. But there is a third, less common narrative that some families tell. This is called an oscillating narrative, and it is a story that involves ups and downs, good times and bad. Grandpa grew up in poverty but started a successful business, but then was injured in the war and could no longer work, and the business failed. But then later your aunt took it over and rebuilt it. Your mother graduated from college and got a good job, but then she got laid off during the recession. But later she found a new job and had a successful career until she got sick. But regardless, no matter what, we stuck together as a family. This oscillating narrative is your story because it's our story. It is God's story with us. And psychologists have discovered that it is this oscillating narrative that gives children self-confidence, even courage, because through it they learn they can expect both good times and bad times, and they learn they can weather difficult circumstances. One of the great things about being part of a community 
that is bigger than ourselves, whether it's a family or a school or a church or a country, is that we learn the oscillating narrative of that community. Because every community, every family, every church, every nation has an oscillating narrative. No one story is only ascending or only descending. And to say so is to ignore half the story. Aziza Bashar and her husband and children lived near Aleppo when the Syrian war began. At the time, her son Hamed was four years old, and when they began experiencing nearly constant bombing and shelling and sniper fire, he was terrified, he was traumatized. At one point, their village was under siege for eight days straight. It was during that siege that Aziza made a decision. They could not stay there. So she marched her family out of the war zone, walking and at times running to Kurdistan, where they stayed for several years. But things were not so great there either. So finally she decided they needed to get to Greece, which could only happen by crossing the sea separating Turkey from Greece. The problem was that Hamed, now seven years old, was terrified of the water. He'd never seen the ocean except on television and was convinced that it was full of sharks. Aziza made up stories to try to quell Hamed's fears. Don't be afraid. She'd say, the ocean is wonderful. It'll just take a couple of hours and then you can go to school and we'll live in a nice house. Unfortunately, on their first attempt to cross, what happened was a lot closer to Hamed's imagination than Aziza's promises. Their boat was made to hold 35 people, but it was packed with twice as many. There were no life vests for anyone. When they got just a little ways out, the boat started to capsize. Aziza had a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a nine-year-old on that boat with no life vests. Thankfully, the boat turned back and made it safely to the Turkish shore. But back on land, Aziza faced a new challenge, how to convince her children to get on another boat. She did it by describing to them the brightest future imaginable on the other side of that water. She promised the second journey would be totally different than the first, even though she knew it probably wouldn't be. And when they finally got on that second boat, Hamed was so terrified, she pulled him into his lap and told him to go to sleep, which thankfully he did. He slept the whole journey and they made it safely. Of course, the stories she told about their life there weren't quite like she had promised. They lived in a tent in a crowded refugee camp and the kids didn't get to go to school right away, but still, Aziza knows it was the promises she made and the stories she told that enabled her family to endure the challenges of their journey to a new home, which although imperfect, is a step closer to the life that she desires for her children. There are plenty of times for each one of us when the promises of God do not feel like they are true, at least not the way we hoped. People get sick and die young. Inexplicable tragedies take our breath away. Relationships we were sure would last deteriorate in spite of all our best efforts. Addiction tightens its grip and devastates lives. The futures we had hoped for, even when we get all the things we thought would make us happy, often feel just out of reach. So this questioning God's promises, this wondering what it all means, this struggle to make sense of unexpected and undeserved suffering, this time in the valley is part of all our stories. But so is this story at the top of a mountain. When Peter and James and John, when we witness this miracle of Jesus shining like the sun, of Moses and Elijah returned, of God's voice speaking from the clouds, 
on the mountaintop between two valleys, we receive a glimpse of this truth of who Jesus is. And we carry this truth with us through all the ups and downs of the journey to come. Do you know where your grandparents grew up and how they made a living? Do you know how they struggled? Do you know how your parents met and fell in love? Do you know about the times they almost split apart? Do you know your family's greatest success? Do you know your family's worst failure? Do you know your family's story? Claim it. Claim all of it. Tell all of it. And grab hold of the mountaintop moments along the way, those times when, if only for the briefest moment, the truth burns so brightly that its after image is there whenever we need to remember God's promises to love us, to be with us, to sustain us wherever the journey leads. Amen.